morning. This morning's reading is taken from Genesis chapter 11, reading from verse 1 to 26. And I apologize up front if any of the names are yours and I have mispronounced them. It's headed the Tower of Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name of our, for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. From Shem to Abram. This is the account of Shem's family line. Two years after the flood, when Shem was a hundred years old, he became the father of Arphaxad. After he became the father of Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxad had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And after he became the father of Shelah, Arphaxad lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Shelah lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And after he became the father of Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he became the father of Ryu. And after he became the father of Ryu, Peleg lived 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ryu had lived 32 years, he became the father of Serug. And after he became the father of Serug, Ryu lived 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor. And after he became the father of Nahor, Serug lived 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the word of God. try that again. Good morning. Nice to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining together in worship and participating in our service. I see Michael here. Does that mean Oliver's here as well? That's wonderful. So the youngest member of our congregation at about three weeks and six days, one month and two days, uh, is in the baby room this morning. Uh, we're very excited for for the Rogers, and uh, it's nice to have Oliver with us. Thanks for being here. Uh, let me pray. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, would you take these words, uh, especially those nine verses about the tower and about Babel, uh, would you apply them to our lives? Help us to hear them as we should. Help us to understand them as we should. And make them work in our lives, we pray. We pray that we would see the Lord Jesus 
and our great need of Him this morning. Amen. Did I introduce myself? If we've not met before, I'm Nick. I'm one of the ministers here. Uh, Dave is, uh, is preaching at Maison d'Olivia this morning. Uh, so there's another service happening there, uh, and, a, and a bunch of people are gathered. That's where Dave is this morning. Uh, this is a story that, as I've been preparing uh, this week, has, has hit me hard. It's been good for me, but in a tough love kind of way, um, and I'll explain why. I, I suppose that sometimes I'm a very highly motivated person. I can be very ambitious. Other times I can be a very unmotivated person. Some tasks excite me and I'm ambitious about some things. Other things, not at all. As I think about myself, I, and I try to stop and pay attention every now and again, um, I notice uh, that often uh, what motivates me, and often uh, hidden in there subtly in, in what I want to do and what I want to achieve, is this, a great name. I want to make a name for myself. Uh, sometimes it's very subtle. Uh, sometimes it's woven into lots of other motivations, good ones, uh, right ones. But I can't get away from this sense that, um, I guess I think too often, about what people say about me when I'm not around them. And I think too often about, uh, about great things I could do with my life. We heard about megalophobia this morning, the fear of big things. There's another pathology called megalomania. Hmm? Uh, and it's very easy to fall into that one. And I'm certain that all of you, as you think about yourselves carefully, can identify something of that in yourselves, in your own hearts and in your own lives. Uh, when, you, when you consider your inner self, uh, often your thoughts, unrecognized sometimes and very subtly sometimes, say, I want to do this thing. It's a good thing to do and I want to do it. But the reason I want to do it is so that people will know I did it. I did it. I want a name for myself. The word for that is a simple word, an ugly word, pride. Uh, in these nine short verses, uh, Babel convinces us, Babel persuades us that pride and all of pride's achievements, so-called achievements, will be overthrown by the Lamb. Pride and all of pride's so-called achievements will be overthrown by the Lamb. So I'm going to tell the story of Babel in a way that helps us to feel its oomph, because there's plenty of oomph, uh, and I'll pause from time to time to, ref uh, to reflect on our world. And then I want to jump from Genesis to Revelation, where the story of Babel comes to an end, uh, John's vision of the Lord Jesus. And uh, by that time, I hope we have seen that pride and all of pride's achievements will be overthrown by the Lamb. So let me tell the story. It all happened as great nations were beginning to emerge. The sons of Noah uh, were becoming all the families of the earth. These are the sons of Noah, of whom it had once been said, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Those sons of Noah, every inclination of the human heart evil from childhood, those sons began to turn into great nations. And they all spoke one language. And because everybody spoke one language, the whole world could get stuff done together. They could hold hands with great togetherness, side by side, understanding one another, with great power in that sense of togetherness. And they could get stuff done. Having been cast out of God's presence all those generations ago to the east of the garden, this society continues moving eastward. And to, in the east they find this wide open plain called Shinar. Uh, and in the language of the day, Shinar means Babylonia. Uh, they decide to settle themselves down uh, because this plane looks fit for a life. 
And then using their common language and holding hands and with a great sense of togetherness and purpose, they say to each other, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. So having established brick fields and uh, stockpiled raw materials and having begun to build, they speak to one another again. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we may be scattered over the face of the whole earth. With a great togetherness comes a great project, the largest temple tower known to man. They plot and they plan and they cast vision and they scheme and they dream uh, in their one tongue of a high tower so high it reaches to the heavens. It will require a spectacular effort. It will require a spectacular to togetherness great leadership and great camaraderie and an amazing team culture to put this thing up. It will be stunning. It will be mega, grandiose, memorable, a tower to the heavens. People will come down the mountainside and find their feet on the plain and they will gawk at what a great tower has been built. And, of course, a name, a great name, a fantastic reputation. What a great people these must be to build that great tower that reaches into the skies. The people will gawk with amazement at what a, what a wonderful group of people these are. Here is their dream. Of course... This is the story of the descendants of Adam and Eve. Do you remember all those generations ago, as we have been telling our story, Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent. The serpent who had said all those generations ago, God knows that when you eat from it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, like God. God. And now, all these generations later, it's the taste of God-likeness, a name, a fame, a reputation. It's caught up with them again. A tower into the heavens and a great name. What a dream. It smells, it tastes of destiny and of glory and success. Who couldn't get behind a project like that? There's also a nightmare in mind. They don't want to be scattered across the face of the earth. Who would? This would be the end of this powerful, together, holding hands society made powerful by its togetherness. So drawn towards the dream of a great name and spurred on by the fear of scattering and splintering, they cast a grand vision. They plan and plot. They begin to build. What a fantastic thing it will be. What a display of effort and power and human ingenuity. What greatness will come of this tower. And as the people cast their grandiose vision, as they plan and plot, as they gather their materials, as they just begin their building, we discover a new scene. Someone we haven't yet met arrives on the scene. His name is the Lord. He is enthroned in heaven. Verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord came down. This new character throws a new perspective on what they're up to. From His heavenly glories, the holy Creator who made the humans from the dirt of the ground must squint and strain His eyes to see over there the tiny little tower that the earthlings are busy building. Uh, he looks at the Leonardo and the Michelangelo. Uh, he must put it under 
the electron microscope just to see what's going on. It's so small. You can imagine mom and dad uh, watching the little toddler building sandcastles. Ach, that's cute. God the Creator, as He sees all, must come down to see what the humans perceive as the greatest tower ever made. The Lord dwarfs it. It's tiny. Their ambitions are parochial, and their power is tame. The prophets have said of Him, He sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. What are you dreaming of or dreaming for? And how is your name attached to it? Our biggest dreams, our huge schemes that we think of even beyond our achieving and beyond our imaginings, just dwarfed in the godness of God. Whatever name, reputation, Whatever fame or memory or glory we think we might achieve, finally when our dreams come true. All the glories of God, the weightiness of God, just makes it puny. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Well, now it's the Lord's turn to plan. Uh, Just as the people had planned this tower, now the Lord plans. He will end the power of their togetherness. He will put an end to their common language and the oneness of their society so that they can never again hold hands in this way because when they do, it is for evil. So He confuses their language. Those who spoke to each other can no longer speak to each other. Uh, Through the confusion of their language, the building project stops, and their nightmare, their being scattered across the world, comes true. The people who feared being scattered are scattered in God's judgment. Uh, God conquers over their plans as He judges them. He deals with their arrogance by crippling the togetherness which once made them strong. Their pride is judged. The tower and the city are left unfinished. What was meant to be a great monument to their brilliance is instead a pile of rubble, a monument to their folly, the idiocy of pride. Instead of seeing a great tower, those who pass by the valley of Shinar see ruins, and surely they must giggle, they must laugh, thinking, who thought this was a good idea? That was a bit dumb. Couldn't they finish it? Jeepers, this all looks a bit sad. The place is named Babel, verse 9. And in the language of the day, that sounds a lot like the word confused, because that was where the Lord judged the pride of people by confusing their language. So what do we learn from this story? Well, we learn there's a kind of society-wide sin. There is a kind there is a kind of evil that we could call systemic or societal, a kind of evil where it's difficult to pinpoint exactly which individuals are responsible for it and how. But when you zoom out and you look at the shape of society and what they're up to, you realize this is wrong. Even Adam in the garden, very easy to see how the individual sinned. But as sin weaves its way through the story of Genesis 1 to 11, as it has done week after week, and we get to Babel, we see a whole group of people with great purpose and togetherness and unity sinning as a city, sinning as a society. We can't name the individuals, but the guilt sticks to the whole society. That's something we learn from the story. And we learn again the danger of ego, pride, hubris, arrogance, the ambition for a name. 
the ugliness, the desperate folly of grandiosity and megalomania for the sake of a name. And we learn the magnific magnificence of God, the godness of God, the magnitude and weightiness of the Creator, the grandest scheming of humans, the, the grandest plans and, and successes of humans, just dwarfed, He must come down. Uh, he must come and find it like a parent finding castles in the sandpit. See, pride and all of pride's achievements will be overthrown by the Lamb. You should know that this spirit of Babel is alive and well uh, in the history of South Africa. Now, this thing of a society, a group of people holding hands together on a great project with the purpose of making a name for themselves, that's in our history, maybe in our present too. Have a look at this image uh, next to me. Uh, some of us saw that on Monday night, uh, so it's not the first time you've seen it, but take a good look. In the background, you see the plush and prosperous Santon CBD, uh, proud and tall in the background. I happened to be in one of those buildings just yesterday. I noticed there were queues outside the store called Gucci, which I found interesting. It's excessive. It's rich. In the foreground is the street-level squalor, Alexandra Township. Thousands of tiny little sheds, uh, people made in God's image, call them home, make their home there. Heaped on top of one another, poor. Uh, isolated from the wealth and the thriving economy that's almost literally across the road. It's a scandal. It screams injustice. There may be a handful of individuals who we could easily point out and blame for that. That's true. But there's a more fundamental or more basic sense in which the evil of our society is what happens when a group of people hold hands together with the spirit of Babel saying we're going to make a name for ourselves and sin together with great togetherness and purpose. A society that wants to make a name for itself. You see, the guilt doesn't stick so easily to one or two people, but to the society as a whole. It's systemic, it's social. Uh, is, is that not basically what British Empire building was? Driven by the desire for a name, a group of people holding hands together in the spirit of Babel, doing whatever they want to do, to make a name. And so we end up there. Is that not uh, the kind of racist nationalism? A group of people driven by a desire for a name, holding hands together, sinning at a systemic or a societal level. Is it not that which landed us there? And of course, there are the sins of the present day. We rehearse them often. We know them well. They prevent progress and redress and solutions, we know about those. The point is that Babel, this thing we read in chapter 11 of the first book of our Bibles, is not so much a thing so long ago. We can find it right here in sunny South Africa, in Zanzi. We live it. I haven't yet finished uh, the story of Babel. Uh, Babel becomes a nation, a nation called Babylon. Uh, Babylon is the nation that God uses when His people, uh, Israel, are going woefully astray, when they have turned aside from their God to idols, and when they have uh, practiced injustice and oppression among their people. God uses the mighty nation called Babylon to come against them to punish them for their sin, to exile them. So God uses what becomes this powerful nation, Babylon. But even as God uses them, they are arrogant. They are prideful and haughty and boastful. They believe they've done it. They go beyond the bounds of what God has called them to do. Uh, listen to the prophet Isaiah. He's describing Babylon. 
He says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Again, Isaiah says, God will be victorious in judgment over the pride of Babylon. The next time we find Babylon coming up over and over again is in the book of Revelation. Uh, Babylon is one of the big uh, female images, feminine images in the book. The other one is the bride. So let me start with the bride. The bride is dressed in white, her clothes washed in the blood of the Lamb, clean linen standing for purity given by the Lamb, by Jesus Christ. She's the people of God purified by the, by the sacrifice of Jesus. But the, her opposite, her contrast is Babylon, the great prostitute she is called. She is called the great prostitute because the people turn from God to her. She has her, her grandiosity, her pride has become religious. People turn away from God and to her. She's taken on religious proportions. And she's depicted as being drunk on her own power and offering her intoxicating wines to the nations of the world. Her closest ally is the dragon, the devil. She's called Babylon. In Revelation... God promises the judgment and the destruction of Babylon. The angelic announcement cries out. It's in chapter 18. It will appear on the screen. The angel in the vision cries out, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's a victory cry from God's people. It's not a sad statement. It's a happy statement. The God who overcame Babel in judgment will overcome Babylon. It will be a sudden, a great, a victorious, a joyful victory when God overthrows the arrogant who have turned against Him. When He overthrows arrogant and prideful scheming. When He overthrows the vision casting and plotting for the sake of a name. God has seen. God will come down. And God will be victorious over every kind of human pride. The greatest achievements done with the spirit of for my name's sake so that I can have something of God's reputation. They will all come crashing down. Like a parent breaking down the little castles in a sandpit. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So there are two things we must do. Two things we must do. The first is get Babylon out of you. Get Babylon out of you. Uh, chapter 18, verse 4 of Revelation. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Get out of Babylon. It means don't participate in her. Have nothing to do with her ways. Stay away from her so-called glories. Basically, it means get the pride, the haughtiness, the arrogance, the desire for a name and a reputation and a glory. Get it out of you. Of course, let me take a deep breath. Of course, one can cast vision and plan and plot and uh, see the future and carry out great plans with a desire to benefit and serve other people and with a sincere desire that you will be forgotten in all of it. You can do really big, really good things. That's true. It's not a call to stop dreaming or to stop working hard or to lose all sense of ambition. But, on the other hand, you can also dream and cast vision and plan and plot and scheme and build and work hard and in all of that stuff, 
your heart beats for a name. And the scariest of all, those two things often go together. In one little person's complicated heart, there is a lot of genuine intention for good mixed with a healthy dose of, oh, I want a name. Get Babylon out of you. Beware of the heady dreams of reputation and destiny, of a memory that outlives us. Beware of those childish imaginings of what wonderful things people might say of you when your dreams finally come true. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. Remember the story of God coming down to see the great big tower. Your biggest dreams of glory are made puny, insignificant. They shadow in the bright glory of God. Your biggest dreams of fame made small by the fame of His name, the name above all names. Whatever you achieve with the heart of pride, it will come to nothing. It will be ruin, a monument to the folly of a little creature made from the dirt, trying to be like God. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. The second thing we must do is know the blood of the Lamb. Know the blood of the Lamb. The angel is back in chapter 7 of Revelation, is describing those who belong to the bride, those who belong with washed, clean linen to the bride of Christ, the people of God. He says, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What makes all the difference between belonging to Babylon and belonging to the bride? the Lamb, and the blood of the Lamb shed on, shed on the cross. So as I wrestled with my own pride this week, as I noticed disturbing thoughts, um, obsessions that concerned me, patterns of thinking and dreaming, that as I observed them, I realized were no good. And I was glad to have realized that. I saw that, like all my peers, I want a name for, for myself. It was an ugly thing to realize and painful. And in it, I was very glad for the simple truths of the gospel, just the simple truths we know. Jesus died. His death washes clean, brings forgiveness. Uh, the white linen of the bride is not her own. It's given to her by the Lamb. It's wonderful to remember uh, that whatever righteousness I have is not mine. It's given me by Christ. It's His. It's, it's in a way foreign to me. And so it's perfect. Every time I find myself, find in myself that self-important ego, that instinct for grandiosity and megalomania, I remember forgiveness. And I confess. And I'm thankful for clothes cleaned by Jesus' blood. And I remember that His greatness far outstrips whatever thing I think I might do that might be great someday. I commend the same to you. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the, the holy God, who is God above us and beyond us and so far greater than us, that mercifully you are present with us, you know us, you see, you intervene, uh, you, you operate on us when there is a problem. So we pray that you might take the pride and the arrogance the desire for, the na for a name, whether that might be in, in things we think are great or in things we think are every day. May our desire to be noticed and praised and spoken highly of 
please may it die in the light of the glory of God and the gospel. It's because we want to see Jesus glorified uh, truly and honestly in our hearts, from our heart of hearts, that we pray it. Amen.